Dear students, today we are going to talk about the blood formation or hematopoiesis. Hem, hemo uh, means blood, so this is the blood formation. The first stage or first phase of blood formation happens in the yolk sac. This is in the early embryonic life, in the second embryonic month. Later, uh, the liver and the spleen take over this function and this is about uh, till the fourth month. This is called hepatolienal blood formation or hepatolienal phase. Uh, the liver produces much more uh, blood uh, than the spleen and this uh, graph shows that these two organs are the main uh, places for blood formation. This uh, is an interesting thing even for later because in chronic diseases of the bone marrow when uh, the bone marrow is not able to produce blood, the liver and the spleen can take over this function again. And in these diseases, <coughs> for example in chronic leukemia, uh, the spleen and the liver can enlarge enormously. This is a, an enlarged spleen, splenomegaly or hepatomegaly in case of the liver. So later, and this is the permanent phase, when uh, the bone marrow takes over this function, this is called the myeloid or myeloid blood formation or phase. And um, this graph shows that this is from the fourth month, gradually the bone marrow takes over this function. We just have to mention briefly the other component, the plasma uh, formation, because this, what I was talking about so far, was for the cells of the blood. And the plasma is, uh, has a lot of different components that I mentioned last time. The plasma proteins are mainly produced in the liver, immunoglobulins in the plasma cells, and we have many other components, for example, hormones in the endocrine glands, uh, etc. Uh, but this is what you need to know at this moment. So, the myeloid bone formation, let's see some details. Uh, this is in the red bone marrow, which at first, in uh, children, postnatally, uh, it includes all bones. So in all bones we have red bone marrow, so actively producing blood cells. Later, in adult life, uh, mainly it's in the flat bones, so especially the um, uh, skull, uh, the uh, calvaria of the skull, in the uh, ribs, in the vertebrae, in the sternum, so mainly flat bones have red bone marrow. The uh, long bones, it's mainly the proximal ends of the humerus and femur. Here you can see the amount, it's uh, vertebrae and pelvic bones that produce most uh, of the blood, followed by the sternum and lymph. So the red bone marrow is really red because of the red blood cells and the forming blood cells inside. Uh, it's in the spongy part of the uh, bones and if it is becoming inactive, then it has more fat, it becomes yellow bone marrow. Most blood, as I mentioned, is produced in the vertebrae <coughs> and this explains what you have seen in anatomy that the vertebrae uh, have the, the, the body of the vertebrae have huge holes for the huge venous plexuses uh, coming from the uh, bone marrow, bringing all these new blood cells into the circulation. And uh, we can take samples from the bone marrow, which is many times necessary in case we suspect some uh, uh, diseases of the bone marrow, some blood building diseases and a uh, convenient place is the sternum because it's easily reached and uh, main, the main um, place where we take sample from is the iliac crest, it's called crystal biopsy and uh, this is where we can really see the histological structure of the bone marrow. So this is going to be our slide and what you already know from previous classes is the reticular fibers uh, which produces the, the frame, the reticular connective tissue with reticular fibers and reticular cells. This is the frame, the basic frame of the uh, bone marrow. 
And the reticular cells are important not only for producing the reticular fibers and thus uh, for um, making this framework, but also they are involved in blood formation because they produce a lot of cytokines that are important factors in blood formation. You also recognize the bone, bone trabecules, with osteocytes and osteoblasts. And all the rest is what we're going to study now, the developing blood cells with sinusoid capillaries. So uh, I mentioned that when the bone marrow becomes inactive, we call it yellow bone marrow because it contains a lot of fat between the bone trabecules. This is the active form and this is the absolutely inactive uh, form. We can see, of course, different transitions between these two zones or two forms of the bone marrow. Uh, <clears throat> for example, in this picture you can see a transitional form when we have a bone trabecule, a lot of fat, and between them we have like little islands of blood formation. So, of course, if uh, somebody loses blood after bleeding and the bone marrow uh, will become more active to replace the lost blood, then the uh, yellow bone marrow can be uh, transformed to red bone marrow again. So, this is not, a per not necessarily a permanent phase. So, this is what we're going to look at in detail uh, because we have one hemopoietic stem cell which then produces all the blood cells that we learned last time. So the, the blood cells and the blood uh, lines that we're going to deal with, uh, one for the red blood cell, one for the platelets, and several for the white blood cells. And uh, you can go back to this picture at the end, because this summarizes all the necessary stages that you need to know. We're going to deal with them one by one, and as you see, we start with one stem cell, which then divides uh, into different uh, lines that are already committed to become one, uh, one cell. Here you can see how they become committed. One colony is uh, called colony forming unit, one type of cell which becomes um, committed to one line. First, the uh, colony is called the multi multipotent stem cell. This can develop into any other cell. Uh, later, it will be specialized or differentiated. And the CFU always refers to the colony forming unit, which with the E means erythrocyte, meg, megakaryocyte platelet, uh, etc. So here you can see how they become committed to form one uh, cell line. Don't get scared from this picture. I just wanted to show you that uh, there are stimulating factors, different cytokines, different factors that are very important in regulating this very complicated process, how a cell becomes a neutrophilic granulocyte at the end. Uh, you can see that there are many, many factors involved in this. Uh, just remember the word CSF, it means colony stimulating factor. And um, we have different types like granulocyte stimulating factor, <coughs> erythropoietin, thrombopoietin. These are the ones that are worth to remember at the moment because they are already used in therapy. That's why I wrote here, you don't need to learn all these. So now let's see individually each cell line. Let's start with the formation of red blood cells. This is called erythropoiesis. So as you see, during this process, the cells become smaller and smaller with each step. First we have a huge cell with a huge nucleus. And then at the end the cell will also lose the nucleus because we, we know very well that red blood cells do not have a nucleus. So these are the stages you have to know by name. 
So the first cell, which is already <coughs> committed to become a red blood cell, is called pro-erythroblast. The blast cells always refer to some uh, a cell which will become the uh, uh, mature cell, so pro-erythroblast. Then, what is our aim? Our aim is to fill a cell with hemoglobin. So hemoglobin, which makes up a huge part of the cytoplasm, will be produced by rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, ribosomes. So the ribosomes are going to be accumulated at this stage. That is why the cytoplasm is basophilic. So this is our next step, basophilic erythroblast. And we always ask, why is the cytoplasm uh, basophilic? Because of the ribosome accumulation. Then, the ribosomes start to produce hemoglobin. So, when hemoglobin starts to accumulate, this is red, eosinophilic, we have basophilic and eosinophilic staining, so a mixture. And this is why this stage is called polychromatophilic erythroblast polychromatophilic, poly, many, chromato, color, so it's different colors. It's a mixture of basophilic and eosinophilic staining. Why? Because it contains a lot of ribosomes and already uh, produces hemoglobin. When we have enough hemoglobin for the cell, the ribosomes start to degenerate and to uh, disappear from the cells and this is called normoblast, when we have enough hemoglobin already with disappearing ribosomes. So the staining is already the normal staining of the red blood cell, which is red. Uh, you can also find in some books <coughs> the orthochromatophilic erythroblast name, and uh, this also refers to the normal staining of the cell. But it still has a nucleus, and in the next step, the nucleus will disappear, will be expelled from the cell, <coughs> and then we reach the almost mature uh, red blood cell, which is called reticulocyte. The reticulocytes are already sent to the circulation, to the peripheral blood, and within one day, approximately one day, it will be a mature erythrocyte. So here uh, you can see that um, the reticulocytes look almost the same as the major red blood cells. In the blood smear, we cannot distinguish these two. I will show you in the next picture how we can distinguish them. Uh, but before we do that, I just want you to remember some factors that stimulate the blood formation, uh, the formation of red blood cells, erythropoietin, folic acid, vitamin B12 and iron you already heard all these factors. So let's say a little bit more about reticulocytes. Reticulum means network. So reticulocytes contain uh, a network, the remnant of the RNA from the ribosomes in form of a network, disappearing network inside the cell, which is not visible with the Gimsa staining, but visible with the brilliant Cresyl blue staining, so a specific staining for the reticulocytes. And so you don't have to distinguish these cells in, in our uh, preparations, but with a special staining, specific staining, it can be made visible. And as you see, there is a gradual breakup of this reticulum and when we reach the major red blood cell stage, it has none uh, left. It's about 1% of the red blood cells. Of course, after a bleeding, after blood loss, when the bone marrow becomes more active to replace the lost blood, we have an increased percentage of the reticulocytes. And I mentioned erythropoietin, which everybody heard about, EPO, also used as a doping uh, substance. It is produced in the kidney. This is an important thing since you expect then that in kidney diseases there can be anemia because there is no erythropoietin produced. <coughs> Hypoxia stimulates it and of course it reaches the bone marrow through the blood and acts in the bone marrow 
and as I mentioned in kidney diseases, in tumors it can be used as a uh, medicament to stimulate the uh, bone marrow blood production but unfortunately it's also used as a doping material which is of course illegal and the danger of it that it can uh, increase uh, the blood count so that it can cause thrombosis. And I also mentioned that the nucleus is expelled from the cell so blast cells still contain uh, nucleus and in the normal blast stage it will be expelled from the cell to become reticulocyte and this is during development and the mammalian red blood cells do not have um, a nucleus but non-mammalian species like birds have a nucleus this can be important in forensic uh, medicine you have to determine uh, from blood, if, you, if they see nucle nucleated red blood cells, of course, then it cannot be mammalian uh, blood, it can come from chicken, for example. But what is also very important for uh, medical students is that embryonic red blood cells do have a nucleus. So uh, these pictures show you <coughs> from abortions uh, placental tissue, chorionic villi, where we have embryonic later fetal blood vessels and you can see that uh, this is this preparation is <coughs> before week 10 all embryonic red blood cells have a nucleus after week 12 no cells have a nucleus between these two we have some with nucleus some without so this helps the pathologist to determine the uh, embryonic age or fetal age. Okay, let's go on. Let's move on to the platelets. Platelets are developing from the megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes, mega means big, karyo is nucleus. So these cells, the nucleus is huge, that, and of course the whole cell is huge. These are the only cells that you do have to recognize in, uh, in the slides. So <clears throat> these are really big cells, look like a flower, the nucleus, the multi-segmented nuclei can be more than 100 micrometers and the platelets are actually cytoplasmic fragments from the uh, megakaryocytes, so they are not entire cells, just little fragments, that's why they look like pieces of dirt in uh, the blood smear. You can see how much bigger these cells are than the rest of the blast cells and the cell fragments are thrown into the sinusoids. And finally, let's go on to see the white cell development. This is a little bit more complicated and since we have different types of white blood cells, uh, we have the granulocytes, the monocytes and the lymphocytes and um, they come from blast cells. These two are very easy. Lymphocytes come from lymphoblasts and monocytes come from monoblasts. So these are easy. The lymphocytes, uh, <coughs> at this uh, moment we don't have to know more details how they develop. The lymphoid line separates from the rest very early uh, during this uh, commitment and differentiation process and we have TB and NK cells, how they develop further in the thymus or in separate uh, compartment of the bone marrow, we're going to learn next semester when we do the lymphatic tissue. So just remember lymphoblasts and lymphocytes. Monoblast, monocyte, also easy to remember. And the granulocytes, it's a little bit more complicated. The uh, cell, which will become one of the granulocytes is called myelo or myeloblast and you can see that at this stage we cannot distinguish whether it's a neutrophilic, eosinophilic or basophilic granulocyte but at the next stage when we have the granules already uh, we can see neutrophilic, eosinophilic and basophilic granulocytes first it's called promyelocyte then with further uh, de uh, development, <coughs> it's called myelocyte. 
and you can see that at this stage they do not show the characteristic form of the nucleus which is very uh, typical for the granulocytes but the segmentation of the nucleus starts in the next stage when first we have just like a bean shaped nucleus a little indentation these are the young forms or metamylocytes and uh, it's also called uh, using the german name the stub or bend uh, form when they bend uh, later s shaped or c shaped stages and then so these are the young forms the uh, the final stage is when we have the fully segmented nucleus, three, four, five segments in the neutrophils and two segments in the eosinophils. As you remember, uh, normally they are about 1% of the neutrophilic granulocytes, which are the young forms. And when we have an infection, the number is increased. Why? Because the bone marrow will be more active, will more actively produce <coughs> the white blood cells to fight the infection and uh, there is a faster development. So more immature forms will be sent to the circulation. So the number or percentage of these white blood cells will increase. So we will see these young forms in more than 1%. This means, or this is called, that uh, the blood count is shifted to the left because we used to uh, write on the left side the young forms shifted to the left. It means usually a severe infection. <coughs> Just an interesting thing that can explain uh, why these two cells are able to phagocytose because they develop from a common ancestor, from one common uh, a blast cell and neutrophils and major macrophages are able to phagocytose so from the bone marrow they enter the blood and then from the blood white blood cells typically leave the circulation and enter the tissues so let's turn back to our slide bone marrow slide uh, as i mentioned you already know the reticular connective tissue which is the basic framework and you also recognize the bone uh, trabecules with the bone uh, lacunae where we have the osteocytes and the osteoblasts in the periphery. You can also see a lot of fat, fat cells. The uh, fat is a little bit different than in other parts of the body uh, because fat cells can be really big in the white uh, or yellow bone marrow. Here you can see just uh, normal uh, fat and you can recognize the uh, sinusoid capillaries where we have normal blood cells. So this is a fenestrated uh, sinusoid type of <coughs> capillary, which we will learn in detail next time when we do the blood vessels. And the only cell that you have to recognize is the megakaryocyte. These are easy to recognize because they are much bigger than the other cells. Here, one here, here, <coughs> here, and the nucleus looks like a, a flower with the many segments. All the other cells you don't have to recognize. You really have to be an expert to determine exactly which stage of the cells these are. Uh, just remember the megakaryocytes. And uh, at the end I would like to show you some diseases that of course you will learn in detail in pathology and then in hematology, <coughs> uh, leukemia, everybody heard about leukemia. Uh, it means white blood, uh, the word, because the number of white blood cells is increased. Why? Because there is a stopped uh, development. So development is stopped at one stage, which has two consequences. We don't have enough mature white blood cells to fight diseases. So these patients are prone to uh, different infections and the immature forms will increase in number. So in these cases, the number of white blood cells is way over the normal 10,000. And you can see a lot of immature forms in the blood 
here you can see the different forms. We can have acute and chronic lymphoid or myeloid forms. And you can see that the blood uh, has all these immature forms, all these blast cells, so, and, and many of them. So this is, of course, not normal. Fortunately, we can treat a lot of these forms uh, nowadays. Then, also very important, and with the chemotherapy, irradiation, and a lot of other medicaments have, as a side effect, uh, myeloid suppressive effect. So they suppress the activity of the bone marrow, and as a consequence, the patient will have anemia and uh, less white blood cells to fight infections. So there are a lot of consequences of this. And there are certain drugs when, uh, during the treatment, every week or every month, the patient have to, has to be checked for the activity of the bone marrow. And uh, finally, just one uh, slide, bone marrow transplantation. Everybody heard about this in bone marrow diseases. When uh, uh, from a, a donor, a hemopoietic stem cell is transplanted. So thank you very much for your attention.